My name is Bob Workman. I am the director at the Ulrich Museum of Art here at Wichita State University. Um, we welcome you to our panel this evening. This is um, the last of a series of talks to support the post-date exhibition, post-date photography and inherited history in India. And um, this is the third of four nights of programs that we are producing. So um, we sincerely appreciate your uh, participation with us. Um, we're here this evening to explore the voices of partition, a panel discussion examining facets of the 1947 partition of India through the perspectives of art history, history, and personal experience. Partition is one source that informed the nine contemporary Indian photographers, or artists, excuse me, um, presented in post date on view at the Ulrich through December 7, uh, 13. My role this evening is very limited, which I'm happy for, um, but it's actually quite important because I have the pleasure of acknowledging all those people that made this quite phenomenal exhibition possible. Um, I'll digress from my notes for a second. Um, I'm pretty informed on the history of the Ulrich and what we've accomplished, and I would challenge anybody to tell me of another exhibition that the Ulrich has been involved with at the level that we've been involved with post-date that is as important as this exhibition. I, I truly think it is... <laughs> it, Post date could hold its own against any exhibition in the world today. There's no question about that. Um, first off, we're very happy that Post date was collaboratively organized between the San Jose Museum of Art, and I have to confess, they did most of the heavy lifting, um, and the Ulrich Museum of Art. Um, post date came to us through the remarkable talents of a former curator here, Jody Throckmorton, um, when we negotiated, <laughs> Jody has a fan club that's been following her around for the last few days. Um, when we negotiated Jody's employment, we agreed to um, provide Jody with the resources to continue her work on post date when she came to the Ulrich. Um, the bulk of that was doing her writing while she was here for the book. Um, but to be able to have an exhibition of this magnitude and to work with the quality of staff of San Jose is really quite an honor and um, something that we should all be uh, pleased to have here in Wichita and we should make sure that as many people as possible hear about it and come to see it. Post 8 is made possible by the generous support of the Andy Warhol Foundation for the Visual Arts, the National Endowment for the Arts, the Asian Cultural Council, and Christie's. The Ulrich presentation has been generously supported by Mickey Armstrong, Bill and Donna Ard, Gridley Family Foundation, Richard D. Smith and Sandra Langle, John and Nancy Brammer, Norma Griever, Guyan and Manorama Kicha, Tom and Nancy Martin, Ron and Lee Starkle, George and um, Eleanor Lucas, and the Ulrich Alliance through a sculpture affair. Program support is provided by the Kansas Humanities Council, the City of Wichita, and Wichita State University. We sincerely appreciate the Kansas Humanities Council for their specific additional support for this lecture tonight. At this time, I get to turn the podium over to post date curator Jody Throckmorton. Jody was on staff here at the Ulrich from, and I'm gonna give the dates so she can, can't uh, pretend it's otherwise, July of 2013 to September 2014. We have this on, ongoing joke that Jody was here 15 months, but in 15 months she produced two blockbusters for us, the first being Bruce Connor, Somebody Else's Prince, and now Post Date. So, um, I don't think there's been any other curator in 15 months period that's done two uh, shows of this magnitude, and we're very grateful. <laughs> but that's the last reference you're ever going to get from me, Jody. Um, Jody is now curator of. Um,
at the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts in Philadelphia. And there she oversees PAFA's Contemporary Art Exhibitions Program, including Morris Gallery Program and the Sculpture Plinth Program. Prior to serving as Curator of Modern and Contemporary Art here at the Ulrich, Jody was Associate Curator at the San Jose Museum of Art. She holds a Master of Arts in Museum Studies from San Francisco State University and a BA in Art History and French from the uh, University of Nebraska-Lincoln. So please join me in welcoming to the podium Jody Throckmorton. Thank you all very, thank you all for being here tonight to um, talk about what I think is a very important subject. And I, I really want to thank especially our panel participants for taking time to um, share their stories and, and teach us a little bit about partition. So thank you all for being here. I also really want to thank Jana Durfee, who um, has done so much to pull really wonderful education material and, and programming together for this exhibition. So thank you, Jana. Um, two generations after the exaltation of hard-won independence in 1947 and the concurrent horrors of the partition of, in of India into India and Pakistan, the artists represented in post-date photography and inherited history in India are paving the way for a new generation of Indian thinkers who are reclaiming and reappraising the history of their country. These artists look closely and critically at the distinct history of Indian photography from the early days of the medium and at the height of the British occupation of the subcontinent in the 19th century to contemporary digital practices. The artists take history into their own hands, redefining iconic images of India and investigating the complex relationship between traditions of representation and contemporary practice of image making. And you really can't talk about this history in India without touching on partition. And though there's only one artist in the exhibition whose work focus, focuses on, directly addresses partition, um, a lot of them are responding to, to shifts that, that happened along with that moment. So um, Anu P. Matthew is, and I wonder if any of you hopefully got to, had a chance to see her speak when she was here, but she's a really incredible person and photographer. But despite having lived um, for many years in her child, of, in India for many years of her childhood, um, and then living in the UK and then in the US, Matthew felt vastly uninformed about partition. And, and after receiving a Fulbright um, to go to India, she began to put, collect portraits from the late 1940s from families who were affected and displaced during partition. She would take the images from the photo albums and and, and photograph subsequent generations of the family and to morph them into digital animations. I want to show just a short clip from one. As you can see, they, they, Anu starts with a historic photograph from the family's album, and it slowly morphs into a piece that, um, that speaks to, that only exists in the, in, the, in, the, in the digital world and calls attention to the subtle, perhaps, but important shifts that happened through generations of families and how um, this moment really informed people's lives in a very personal way. And Anu places all of these stories inside of an encyclopedia, as you saw in the last image, of, the, of a description of partition. And in so doing, she inserts, inserts these personal voices into, this, into the larger historical narrative of this important um, moment in Indian history. And this desire to insert these personal stories 
echoes the work of organizations like the 1947 Partition Archive, which we'll hear um, more about later. But it really echoes this desire to capture and share these important personal experiences, and something that we hope will be the result of the panel tonight. Um, a note on our format for this evening, um, we're Dr. Emily Rook Kepsel, who is assistant professor in the Department of International and Area Studies at the University of Oklahoma, and Dr. Atul Rai, who is associate professor and Larry Jones faculty, faculty fellow in the W. Frank Barton School of Business at Wichita State University, will give short presenta presentations on the history and context of partition. Then Elaine Jones um, from the 1947 Partition Archive will tell us about her organization's efforts and then lead a discussion with Dr. Prem Bajaj, who was associate professor, um, who is associate professor emeritus in the Department of Mathematics and Statistics at Wichita State University. His wife, Raj Bajaj, Zahida Lodi Khan, whose grandson is here, has kindly agreed to be here to trans, her grandson, Miraz Khan, is here to translate for her this evening. Um, they'll all be, they're all people from your local community who many of some have been here for 45 years, in fact, um, that experienced this event directly and are here to share their stories with us tonight. And at the end, we will all come, we'll all be on stage um, for a short Q&A. And without further ado, I'd like to welcome Dr. Emily Rook Kepsel. Thank you all. You'll have to excuse me. I, I have unfortunately a seasonal cold, so I will do my very best to get all of my information to you um, without coughing at you, and I apologize. Um, and I also want to say that I'm going to talk a little bit about the partition, but I'm mostly going to be focused very clearly on sort of the years of 1946, 47. So we're not going to have the large, long history of India, which is both beautiful and nuanced and interesting and fascinating, but also not capable of being done in 10 minutes. Okay, so I'm going to start with, um, on February 20, uh, 20th, 1947, in the midst of escalating communal violence between Muslims and Hindus, primarily in Bengal and Punjab, Clement Attlee, the British Prime Minister at the time, announced that Brit the British would leave India in June 1948 at the latest. Um, the announcement was far from a surprise, considering that Indians had, oh, thank you, had set up, oh, wow, <laughs> had set up a, consti a constituent assembly in 1946, which included members from both major political parties, the Indian National Congress and the All India Muslim League, to write a constitution for an independent India. While both Congress and the Muslim League agreed that India should be independent, the parties disagreed significantly about several structural issues in the creation of an independent India. Most notably, the Muslim League argued from their point of view um, that negotiations with Congress had showed that a sizable Muslim population, and in India in 1947, that's about 25% of the population, would be excluded from civil and political life and would be treated as anti-national interlopers. In the assembly, Muhammad Ali Jinnah, the head of the All India Muslim League, argued that without both the establishment of autonomous states comprised of Muslim majority provinces, and we can see where those are, um, and the enshrining of strong political and civil society minority rights, including separate elections and reserved seats for Muslims, and the recognition of Muslims as fully Indian citizens and therefore eligible for social welfare and employment non-discrimination, the establishment of an independent India would constitute Hindi Hindus as a quote-unquote brute majority capable of treating Indian Muslims as permanent underclasses in the state. The Congress Party, on the other hand, argued that Congress was a secular organization, interested in representing all of the people in the state, regardless of religion, class, caste, or geography. The Congress leader, Jawaharlal, Jawaharlal Nehru, sorry, argued forcefully that Muslims did not need special accommodations in India, because each citizen would be treated equally and fairly Moreover, Nehru emphasized that allowing for separately organized states would compromise, would, uh, comprised of Muslim majority provinces, would make the governing and control of a new country difficult, if not impossible. Importantly, Nehru and Gandhi consistently argued that Indian Muslims and Indian Hindus 
had essentially the same culture, lived in the same lands, and had lived together for thousands of years. While the political battle in the Constituent Assembly waged on, violence between Hindu and Muslim communities throughout the country raged, spurred on by petty acts of violence and vandalism perpetrated by both sides. For example, in a small village in Punjab, and this is coming out of archival information, um, both British and Indian archives, um, in a small village in the Punjab, and that's the western portion here in green, um, the eastern portion of the western portion in green. <laughs> uh, in early February 1947, a militant Hindu newspaper claimed that a group of Muslim boys had insulted a Hindu girl on her way to school. The, some members of the Hindu community, and it's important here to say that not all members, right, some members of the Hindu community um, retaliated against this perceived injustice or slight by slaughtering a pig in the local mosque this is something that is considered haram um, or unclean um, for Muslim, under Muslim dietary laws. Angry about this act of vandalism, some Muslims in the village slaughtered one of the village headmen's cattle um, and left the carcass in the public square and cows are considered um, holy for some Hindus. So this was an act of violence. When the cow was discovered in the square, members of the Hindu community began looting the Muslim businesses and burning some Muslim fields. And from there, violence escalated on both sides to assault, rape, and even murder um, with in, al along communal lines. It was in this backdrop of escalating communal violence and mixed population center, in mixed population centers that on June 3rd, 19, uh, 1947, Lord Mountbatten, he's the gentleman in the middle, um, Nehru, uh, who is in the cap, and Jinnah, who is the other gentleman on the side, um, and other political leaders agreed upon a plan to partition the country to put strong minority safeguards um, to protect what would be mi sizable minority populations in each state. So it's clear here that both Nehru and Jinnah are thinking that after partition happens, essentially everyone stays where they are or some people move. They didn't envision the kind of mass migration that ended up happening. And so they were thinking that they had to do a plan for partition and at the same time enshrine minority rights and minority safeguards because there were likely going to be large populations of Hindus and Sikhs in Pakistan and large populations of Muslims in India. Um, and what you have is um, when this starts, when this is announced, all of a sudden, the Indian state has to start doing a whole series of things in order to get ready for partition. So one of the things that happens is that all of the state resources need to be split four to one. Four things for India and one thing for Pakistan based on populations. And so you ended up with libraries being split, finances being split, encyclopedia sets being split, armies being split, which becomes much more important later on, public servants being split, et cetera, because we're starting, we're trying to take this whole situation apart. Yet, while this was going on, there were a huge number of, of uncertainties. The first major uncertainty was, where was partition going to be? Um, when partition, when it was decided that partition was going to happen, one of the things that the British government did was called in a, a London lawyer named Cyril Radcliffe. And Cyril Radcliffe's job was to draw the lines. Draw the lines in the east that would comprise East Pakistan and draw the lines in the west that would comprise West Pakistan. Cyril Radcliffe had never been to India before, uh, didn't know anything about it. He got there in June. It's an extremely hot month. He immediately got dysentery. There's a very famous W.H. Auden poem about this. He immediately gets dysentery. The maps that he's given are old and out of date. The census he's given is old and out of date. So he just does it. He just draws a line and he had no, he didn't inspect the land, so the lines had nothing to do with people's lands, they didn't have anything to do with where rivers went, they didn't have to do anything to do with where towns were, where major population centers were. So all he had was these maps. And moreover, the line was not fully, completely 
finalized until August 17th, which is three days after independence for Pakistan and two days after independence for India. So you have this line, people had all kinds of questions about partition when it started, when it happened. They didn't know where was Pakistan, where was India. They didn't know whether partition meant that they were going to have to leave their homes and lands. They didn't know whether Pakistan would be a fully independent country or whether it would be two independent countries. They didn't know whether the leaders of the Muslim League would actually move to relocate to Pakistan. In fact, many people felt that Jinnah, who was the head of the All India Muslim League, would stay in Bombay. There was a lot of questions about whether minority citizens minority people would be citizens in the new countries, whether Hindus and Sikhs would be citizens in Pakistan, whether Indian uh, Muslims would be s citizens in India. And so this uncertainty caused a lot of problems. An additional uncertainty um, that was a really important and dangerous one, not even here, sorry. This is Independence Day in India. A uh, really important and dangerous one was the decision by the British on 14th and 15th August to remove most of their troops from the subcontinent and to have at the same time a lot of the Indian and Pakistani troops moving around. So you really didn't have strong army or police presences anywhere because they were either moving to new positions or leaving the country altogether. So while independence was being celebrated around the two new countries, ongoing civil unrest and uncontrollable riots meant that independence was covered was colored by the pain and uncertainty of a hastily conceived partition. Because independence happened at the same time as upheaval, death, and destruction in the riots of partition, many people, even the proponents of Pakistan, felt disappointed at the meager change that independence actually heralded. Indeed, the announcement and preparations for partitioning the country increased the violence in the border area, pushing people to leave their homes in search of safety, but the large caravans and hurried nature of their leaving meant that migrating people were targets of violence. Initially, many people left their homes in haste with the idea that, they would, that the violence would be temporary and they would be able to return to their homes and lands in no more than a few days. Hence, many refugees brought only what they could carry and had no particular destination in mind. As a result, flying ref uh, fleeing refugees lacked water, blanket, blankets, food, and clothes when they finally reached refugee camps on either side of the border. Moreover, moreover because almost no refugees were able to return to their homes, most also lost land, family keepsake, household goods, and deeds to property, which later could be exchanged for seized property in their new country. Over the course of two months in 1947, approximately 14 million people migrated from their homes, making partition the largest mass migration in human history, according to the United Nations High Council for Refugees. Moreover, more than 500,000 people were killed, and many more died of exposure, illness, or poor conditions in refugee camps. Uh, and this is images of the, of the migration. Uh, the violence that they were fleeing from was largely communally orient oriented with Hindus and Sikhs attacking Muslims and Muslim property and Muslims attacking Hindus and Sikhs and Hindu and Sikh property. As the riots went on, some of the violence was more mindless than targeted with victims coming from any sect and looting, across, looting happening across sectarian lines. In Delhi, Muslim residents were forced to flee um, to ad hoc refugee camps as mobs came into their neighborhood and began burning buildings and killing people. Um, this is an image of the, some of the um, refugee camps in Delhi. Um, in Lahore, Sikh and Hindu houses were simili similarly set alight. Some of the worst violence was perpetrated against women who were seen within the culture as emblematic of national honor. It is suggested that more than 75,000 women were raped and many thousands abducted. The violence was particularly bad because in addition to people moving across the border, Indian and, Army, Indian Army and police troops were also moving, leaving refugees relatively unprotected. For example, special trains, such as that one, um, were commissioned to take people across the border, but the trains were often um, severely overcrowded with desperate people. These slow-moving, often unprotected trains were targets for communal mobs who often boarded the train before they crossed the border to rape, 
rob, and murder the refugees. There were several reports of, on both sides of the border of trains reaching their destinations in flames and full of corpses. The human cost of partition also does not cast the wrench, count the wrenching political or uh, psychological loss of leaving houses, lands, and scenes that had been home for generations, nor the difficult conditions in refugee camps. Yet perhaps the most difficult truth of partition was the violence that was not carried out by the organized militias, police, or army, but by neighbors and sometimes even friends, people who in other times would have joined together to celebrate births and deaths. The extent of personal, political, and effective upheaval the partition has made, even to this day, makes it a difficult subject to examine. While partition was a subject for contemporaneous fiction and poetry, later reflections on the communal rioting, death, and destruction have been more difficult. Contemplating the root causes of the conflict implicates all sides, but does not adequately explain how friends and neighbors could so completely turn on one another. No explanation makes clear how someone could be pushed to tolerate or even, um, or even commit uh, heinous acts of violence on such a mass scale. Just as the victims of partition were often shocked by the brutality of friends and neighbors, oral histories of partition are full of stories who are of people who are shocked by their own brutality. Ultimately, the extreme and inexplicable violence of partition looms over Indian political and, and Pakistani political life and is still salient in the lives of the two nations today. Thank you. Good evening. My name is Atul Rai, and despite Emily, what Emily suggested correctly, that it will be impossible to <clears throat> cover India's complex history in 10 minutes or so, I will attempt to do so because without the historical context, I think it will be impossible to understand what happened in partition. So well, Emily has given a good idea and very good narration of what happened in partition, I will try to explain what happened before it. Yeah. <clears throat> We're going to look at partition of India. I'm going, trying to cover um, uh, these. Can I take it off? Is it possible? I'd like to walk around, actually. <laughs> or maybe I'll just stay here. Uh, yeah, so basically we have, uh, you know, Hindus, Muslims in India. We need to see this in context. Uh, then the British rule in India the politics between 1900 to 1947, and then partition of India. So what happened in partition was not, it was not something that happened all of a sudden in 46 and 47. There was a lot of things that had happened for centuries, and in fact for a millennium, that actually exploded all of a sudden in 1947. So, and then at time permitting, we maybe during Q&A, we will discuss where, where we are now. Okay. First thing we have to understand is the word minority. When we in America think of minority, we think of the minority of whites and African Americans. And I think here, this division of minority in America is along the lines of race. In India, Indian subcontinent, this majority and minority division is along religion. And there are a lot of similarities. For example, we have the, 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 uh, the white uh, majority in America is approximately 70%, and African-American minority is about 14%. This is 2011 census. Currently in India, Hindu majority is about 80%. Uh, so the division is along the re religion in India, and Muslim minority in India is about 13%. By the way, India right now has the second largest Muslim population in the world. <clears throat> but that's where the similarity ends. African Americans came to America involuntarily in 17th century, oftentimes chained at the bottom of the ship, and then worked as slaves in the plantation. Muslims came to India in 10th century, 
with swords in their hand, riding horses, and attacked temples in India, and looted the temples. So that is where the similarity ends. And then they did not just go back, and I think that's where it is important to understand the, where Muslims and what is the role of Hindus and Muslims in Indian subcontinent. They stayed back in India, and <clears throat> they actually settled and established dynasties, and they ruled India for thousands of years. Okay, for example, Mohammed Ghazni was the invader who came in 10th century, and he destroyed, he came and attacked India 17 times and destroyed temples after temples in India. Okay, and then <clears throat> there was, after that, many Muslim invaders came uh, from the Middle East and they actually settled and established dynasties. For example, Gore dynasty in the 12th century established uh, a, a dynastic rule in India. Then Delhi Sultanate <clears throat> established a rule and uh, they ruled uh, Delhi area, North Indian area, for <clears throat> from 12th to 16th century. And then the, the most famous dynasty, Mughal dynasty, established in 1528 or 1526, and was the last dynasty right before British came. And actually, officially, they continued until 19, uh, sorry, 1858, but uh, the rule of Mughal Empire had weakened until about you know, at the end of 18th century. Sorry, uh, yeah, about 1700, a lot of other insurgents had started. And during this period, Hindus and Muslims lived together. <clears throat> when you look at, for example, this is the map of British, uh, Mughal Empire <clears throat> in India. And <clears throat> you see the, the light pink color is the earlier part, but by the end of 17th century or 18th century, it had gone, it had expanded all the way to the south. Now, now the, you know, when you look at Mughal Empire, uh, there was an amalgamation of and fusion of culture from Middle East and the indigenous culture of India. There was, there was <coughs> fusion of culture, architecture, cuisine, music, and, and, and you know, there were rulers who were more <coughs> tolerant of Hindu majority in terms of their religion, and there were rulers in Mughal dynasty who were not. For example, Akbar was, Akbar, Emperor Akbar was quite tolerant of Hindu majority, and during his rule, there was a lot of peace, and <coughs> Shah Jahan, for example, who was, uh, very, who was uh, devoted to art and culture, and he built <coughs> a lot of architecture. By the way, the previous picture was of Kutub uh, Minar. It's a, a tower that was built in 12th century that was before Mughal Empire. Uh, that was an example of what uh, Muslim rulers did in India. It's not that they just came and looted and went back. They actually came down and settled, and they lived together. And then this is Taj Mahal is an example of what happened during Mughal Empire. This is 17th century architecture. <coughs> Shah Jahan, this is again, this is Jama Masjid. This is the second largest mosque in the world. It can uh, hold 25,000 people. This was built in 17th century and uh, it's still the, the, the largest mosque in India and second largest in the world. This was built by Shah Jahan in 17th century. Now, <clears throat> towards the end of Mughal Empire, uh, while Shah Jahan and Jagir, the other Mughal empires, were more quite tolerant and they had the, the policy of uh, tolerance towards Hindu religion, remember they were still minority in India. And, and they were rulers and they had what is called jizya tax, which is the tax of religion. If you are not a Muslim, as long as you pay the tax, uh, they are left alone to, prov to, pro to basically practice their own religion. So there was a religious tax that was imposed. Aurangzeb, when the last ruler, the last known, uh, well-known ruler of Mughal Empire, went beyond that. He actually again went around destroying temples. And during that period, Mughal Empire weakened again. And then the insurgency started and then the Mughal Empire <coughs> started to shrink. And then <coughs> the Hindu rulers from the south 
attacked Mughal Empire and weakened Mughal Empire quite a bit. And, uh, and then that allowed the Britishers to come in. Okay, so now again, I don't have, we don't have time to discuss the entire history, but we will now move forward to what happened <coughs> to, <coughs> uh, uh, then actually after Mughal Empire, then we have the next thing that happened in India after, you know, the battles of uh, different, amongst different uh, rulers and, uh, um, you know, princely states, etc. It was finally the British who came to rule and established their rule. Uh, first, it was British India that, uh, <clears throat> sorry, East India Company that ruled parts of India. But after the, uh, the war of uh, 1857, uh, India came directly under British crown. Okay? So prior to that, it was ruled by British India Company, which was actually <coughs> a corporation, for-profit corporation that had its own army. Imagine that, in 17th century we had a giant multinational company that kept its own army to maintain its commercial interests. And that ruled India until 1857. And it was only after the war in 1857 and, uh, and what happened during that war that the India came under directly under British crown. And, and, and so we can consider that as the period when India was governed by, by, by directly from London, uh, from by, um, uh, by British. <clears throat> now, British did not rule India, the entire land of India, directly. There were several princely states, kings and princes, which were known <clears throat> known as uh, uh, states that were not under British crown. Okay, this map that I have here, uh, the, the maroon color is basically where British rule directly and the yellow color is, this is modern India, by the way. It doesn't show Pakistan, modern Pakistan, but this is enough to understand the point I'm trying to make. The yellow portion is where princely states were run by kings. These princely states did not have control over defense and foreign affairs, which was ceded to British government, but they had a lot of autonomy in domestic affairs, right? So, um, and this is important for partition. The reason I'm making and showing this graph because this is a picture, this is a diagram is, and this map is because it is important for partition. Now, and in the other areas, British ruled directly, all right? So this is what was, uh, this is basically uh, th this thing happened. Now, another thing before I go to the next uh, map is that it is not a single king who is ruling the yellow area. These are local kings, lo local king or prince. These were actually small principalities or you know, small kingdoms, uh, if you will call, call them. And, and in fact, at the time of independence, there were 535 kings and principalities in 1947. They were never unified. They were small little things, uh, you know, uh, but you could call them little, you know, the size of maybe one or two towns like Wichita that were basically they had their own king. And, uh, and they, were, uh, they, were, uh, they were independent, they had their own internal government, but defense and foreign affairs were ceded to, to British uh, for this purpose. Now, <coughs> Now think about it, based on, you know, very, very brief glimpse of Indian history, of Indian subcontinent for thousands of years. Of course, it is much more complicated than what I presented to you. They had lived more or less peacefully. I mean, of course, there were conflicts. Of course, you know, there was the minority Muslims who were ruling majority Hindus. But still, there was, they, they, they mixed together. They basically lived together. And they, they had things that they created together. But, uh, then what happened afterwards? That's a big question for historians and academics to ponder, and I think that's what. But that's why we are here. Uh, I think Emily showed a graph where we showed that the population, Muslim population, was concentrated on east side. She showed the pink areas, which were concentration of Muslim areas on western part of Indian subcontinent, and there was a big lump on the eastern side, which is modern Bangladesh, by the way. Uh, which, was, which was another area where the Muslim population was concentrated. Now the point is that during the, in the western part of the subcontinent, 
the Muslim population had more in common with Hindus living in Western part in terms of culture and cuisine and language because they spoke Punjabi and Pashto or, and they ate uh, a food that was similar. Yeah, they, yeah they, are, they were of different religion, but they spoke a language that was common and ate food that was common. Muslims in East, they spoke Bengali. Muslims of East could not communicate with Muslims of West. There was nothing in common except for religion. It was British who created that subdivision. In 1907, uh, Lord Curzon divided Bengal in two parts. And, he, and that was the first time in India where political division was made purely based on religion. And that sowed the seed of religious disunity in India. Believe it or not, actually, that, that was actually a failed attempt because Bengal was uh, reunified a few years later in 2000, uh, sorry, 1911, because there was so much of a uproar about that. And, and, and I'm not saying that was because of, uh, uni you know, people didn't like it. There, was, there were a lot of economic interests that were unsettled because of the subdivision, so we can't go into, we don't have time to go into that detail. But that was the first time when it was, it was re the religious difference between the, in the lo local population that was underlined. I, I think it would, it would make more sense that uh, the, the, the elites in the society, Muslim elites and Hindu elites, had more in common in terms of their economic interest with British than the, the poor people bo of both religion. And I think it was in the interest of British to, to ensure that the, the, the poor people of India, regardless of their religion, did not unite. Because then it would be difficult for them to rule India. Now, let's fast forward because I think <clears throat> if we actually, you know, a lot of things happened between 1911 and uh, 1947, but a couple of things to note are that India supported, India actually was an, in, India was a colony of Britain, but India also was a nation before independence. India, by the way, participated in Olympics in 1928 as a country, as a separate country apart from Britain. Okay, India was a member of United Nations in 1945 before independence. And Emily can correct me if I think it was, they were, they were a member of League of Nations in 1920s. I think they were. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> India agreed to support British in First World War expecting that British will help them in self-governance after the First World War. That did not happen. Now, what happened, uh, I think Emily has talked about 46, I'll move forward to 1937 when the elections were held uh, in preparation for uh, self-governance. And, um, and it's, and it's a couple of things that are very important at that time. The Muslim League was asking for partition for a separate nation. By the time, I think, uh, the country had, uh, the Muslim League had, uh, was demanding or had demand for a separate nation had started to begin in 19, uh, 1937. But in 1937, when the elections were held, uh, this is the map where uh, the red area is, the dark red area is the area which is directly ruled by Britain and is Hindu dominated. The light red area is Hindu majority princely state. The dark green area is Muslim majority directly ruled British province. And the light green area is, the areas are um, princely states which are Muslim majority, okay? So this is basically where India stood in terms of religion right before uh, partition. When elections were held in 1937, Congress was, at least officially, whether you believe whether every leader or b believed or not, uh, was secular and uh, as, as Emily pointed out, Gandhi and Nehru had always professed 
that India would be a secular country. And they went out of their way, or at least uh, there are records when they went out of their way to assure Muslims that their, their interests would be protected. In fact, proportional representation in legislation was a lot more, uh, the representation was given to Muslims than the, than the population demanded. Okay, now, <clears throat> but important thing for, for, uh, for, for us to note is that in elections, Muslim League did not win majority, even in Muslim-dominated states, provinces. When the elections were held in 11 provinces, there are 11 provinces, Congress won majority in eight of them. In the three uh, areas, provinces which has Muslim population, they did not win uh, majority. To me, this suggests that even the Muslims were not clear that they wanted a separate Pakistan. Because, uh, and this is a very important fact because uh, I think uh, until at least until 1937, it was not clear that Pakistan was the, the demand of every Muslim. In fact, uh, people in Northwest Frontier Province, in fact, were not very clear, uh, were, were uh, against uh, uh, the separate nation of Pakistan. Now, what happened in 1939 when the Second World War started, British, without asking Congress, said that India is joining the Second World War. And this angered Congress who was ruling and they actually quit in, in protest. And <clears throat> Muslim League on the other hand, supported war effort of British. And this was actually another factor that created the confusion because as Emily pointed out in, in her uh, presentation, partition was total confusion. Uh, as she pointed out, uh, the boundaries were not drawn on the, at the time the India in, attained independence. The person who drew the boundary had no idea about India. Radcliffe who came here had no idea about India. Uh, the, the partition was advanced by eight months. It was supposed to be June 48. And Mountbatten decided that we can't stay that long. So he expedited uh, the independence by about seven, eight months. And that created the confusion. But another reason that, you know, this is what happened, and I think I'll just have, I'll just take a few more minutes. 1939, Congress quits in protest against a unilateral decision by British to uh, make India join the war effort. Muslim League says that we are going to uh, support British war effort. Uh, princely states have provided war effort. Okay, so now this actually is, this provides explanation what was the confusion about the partition. In 1942, Congress leaders actually have what is called the Quit India Movement. In uh, uh, 1942, Congress party said that we are not going to have British with any kind of rule, all the, the, the nickel and dime policies of giving us uh, nickels and dime, you know, uh, you know, marginal increment in our self-governance is not going to work. We want British to leave in total. And that is called Quit India Movement. Uh, that's a, I think that that's a very simplistic uh, explanation of what the movement is. But in protest, actually, that is, uh, it, it, but the response of India, uh, of, uh, <clears throat> British government was to put all the Congress leaders in jail. Now what happened was that this gave a free reign to Muslim League leaders to have their propaganda for three years. From 1942 to 1945, there was basically all the Muslim leaders who were basically secular and supporting one nation theory were in jail, while Muslim League leaders who were, in, who were propagating two nation theory had uh, number, nobody to oppose them. Okay, now princes and princely states were not opposed to that because they had been, British, didn't, British proposed the following mo model. This is the most confusing model because they said that we will give freedom to India, okay? So, and then anybody who wants to be free can remain free because they did not want to upset princes who had supported, who had promised their support for British efforts, uh, British, uh, who had promised their support for war effort. Because they didn't want to antagonize princely states. So this gave a total confusion that I think as Emily has well summarized, is that you have countries where, which are free to form their own, uh, to be free, to, to remain autonomous, uh, to join India, 
or to join Pakistan. Now imagine in this map, if countries want to remain autonomous, how can they govern? And if Pakistan is to be formed, then it will not be a contiguous state because Muslim dominated population, uh, this, this is one population in western part, then this is vast swaths of Indian Hindu population, and then, then you have 1,000 miles <coughs> apart, another part in Bangladesh, in eastern Pakistan, and then, uh, and that's what happened. I think that is the confusion that caused, um, uh, that was the, those were the elements of confusion, I think, that led to uh, 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 what happened in Pakistan. I'm not, and I think that is the historical context that I wanted to put before you. And uh, thank you very much for <clears throat> Hi, everyone. Um, thanks for joining us tonight. My name is Elaine Jones, and I'm here as part of the 1947 Partition Archive. And what we do is we complement all the information you heard and all the history you heard um, with human stories, so the, um, the stories of individuals who witnessed that time. And um, so we're, we're a nonprofit startup based in Berkeley, and we're kind of small, but the team is global. Um, we're a very gra grassroots effort. Um, so what the Partition Archive does is we record the oral histories of people who witnessed the 1947 partition. And um, we do it in kind of a unique way. We train people to record oral histories and become citizen historians or volunteer interviewers. And then they go out in their communities and they record stories and then they submit them to us online. Um, actually, we're having a workshop tomorrow here at Ulrich um, from 6 to 8 p.m. where I'll be teaching an oral history workshop. So I'll be teaching you how to record um, interviews. Um, so if you're interested in that, there's a sign-up sheet where you walked in. Um, I'd love to have you guys there. And so um, the stories you're going to be hearing today are from three partition witnesses that have joined us. Um, from left to right is Mrs. Raj Bajaj, Dr. Prem Bajaj, and um, Mrs. Uh, Zah Zahida Lodi Khan, and her grandson Miraz Khan has joined her um, to translate. So. Um, They've all joined us here. There's a lot of stories in Wichita. You're gonna be hearing their stories. And I'm very honored to be here, to be able to be here and to be able to bring their stories to you guys. Okay, we'll start with um, Mrs. Um, Raj Bajaj. And um, she was 13 years old during partition. Um, her family moved from Gujarat to Ferozpur, which ended up being on the newly made border. So, um, Mrs. Bajaj, can you tell us um, a little bit about your school memories in Gujarat? Thing is, at the time, in uh, we're talking about I was um, just like she said about 11, 12 years old, but the, they didn't even care much about the girls' school. They think they thought the girls can only study, reading a little bit, and don't have to go to school. But, but people realize as time passes, actually started with my father, that the girls should be studies, then they get married, how are they gonna get the right as the letters? The how, how are they gonna be, know how they are doing? So anyway, we had an elementary school set up, and all the girls go to their school. It make up really good th and story for everybody. That's, the girls can go to school, they learn reading, they learn writing, and uh, they can mm, develop the friendship. There was no question whether you are Hindu or you Muslim. You are girls. There was, that was a girls' school. And somehow, 
what happened, there was a British, either they were ministry or something, they came also and they start teaching some ABC. And everybody got very interested. I still remember, they, if you learn your lesson, she will always give you some kind of special toffees. So every, that was my biggest memory, that they will just give you, they want to make sure that you eating the, you are going to learn the ABC, otherwise you're not going to get the toffees. <laughs> and that was, I can see, and the second thing, the friendship. Because all the girls meet, met there, and we just uh, developed very good friendship. And the other best memory was, I started reading pretty good, and I used to tell my grandmother, do you know I have a new book, do you want to hear it? And she loved to hear it. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, could you tell us a bit or about your um, experience of partition? Well, you have to make very short, because it's long, you know, even it's so long time, when you talk about it, it becomes so real, and you just seem like you're opening a can of worms. I think it's just very hard to stop. The only thing is, by, we, just like we mentioned, it didn't matter whether we are Hindu or Muslim. We are pretty good friends. Our neighbor was Muslims. I have a Muslim friends. I used to go in their home and try to um, just want to try their the burqa they covers. And uh, even my grandmother sometimes say, what are you doing? I said, you know, can you imagine how good I look in this burqa? <laughs> <laughs> anyway, see that this, that thing happened, but unfortunately, when this partition happened, I was, in India, this, we had a this custom when the summer vacation comes, we go to visit our, you can call our grandparents. And we were visiting our grandparents, which was the Gujarat. And that time, everything was fine. There was nothing going on. But you have one thing I really see, at this time, a 12-year person know more about the, what's going on in this world than that 12-year-old. I really didn't know much about uh, the partition going on, the bad things or nothing. We just having fun and enjoying our life. And my, my mother was with us and she came back and I and my sister, we both stayed in Gujarat. And that's what we caught in the, into the whole thing. All of a sudden, we had to leave the house and because if we stay in the house, they, they set the house on fire, the neighbors, people got killed. But luckily, my uncle, my grandparents and my uncle and my sister, five of us, we, there was a, I can say, a big house like a castle. You can see, we just went there. The door was, the castle door was so, I mean, four or five feet thick. You cannot, you don't worry about that. They're going to, they cannot break it. So you, every, my, my uncle said, we are safe here. There were about 40, 40 or 45 people end up in that place. And the outside seemed like it. You can't see anything up because the doors and everything was, and we were all inside just hearing the big bangs and setting the fires. If somebody didn't open the door, the killing going on. So it stayed about two or three days, two days. And then we thought we can't stay longer than that in that house then we are about to cross back window. And then my, everybody said, we're gonna try, we have to leave the place. Maybe everything calmed down, but somehow it didn't. And when we are jumping, the men came down first and then the women's and 
just like a back window, about three, maybe I think you can say four or five feet down, they keep on going down. And all of a sudden somebody saw, and they say, oh, here we are, we're gonna kill you. And it is just, again, something good happened that there was one person, maybe I can say angel of mercy, he, he came, he said, he saw my uncle. And he said, if you hold on, you cannot touch this person. His grandfather has done so much good for me and my family. You can, if you come close to him and his friends, I'm gonna kill you before, first. Everybody went away and he told us, you're gonna be safe and there's a camp already set up, you guys can come there. And those things seem like a we all got saved and stayed in the camp for almost four or five days because just like he mentioned, there was no police orders, everything was just the world gonna get end. And I'm the, uh, my sis, I was worried about my sister. She was only, I think, about six year old. And uh, that was the, you can talking, it's, it's been so long. It makes you wonder that really happened. Anyway, the biggest problem was we left our house. No telephone, no, no address. My parents left the place and there was, they didn't know where we are. We didn't know where they are. And I was thinking how much possibility is you think you're gonna get together. No picture, you can show, you can see my father. So sometimes I wondered how did it happen anyway. We just got the camp to the Amritsar was the border on the other side, India. So luckily we had some relative there, we got there and some coincidence or God's mercy I think my uncle found out where my parents are. Anyway, we got to, my father came right away when he find out that we are, and just like I saw the train, and actually you, I don't have the picture, but that we, I, my father and my sister, three of us, we travel from Amritsar to Frospur on the top of the train. I couldn't believe, we thought we would wait for the train and one fellow said, at the time I think the killing was pretty much over. But he's, the one person said, you don't want to stand here with the, your daughters. Come on, I help you. And I said, anyway, we sat there and we survive. I'm you watching me otherwise. So the, my point is this, that I, we got saved by the help of the Muhammadan. That was my thing. But my parents, my father my, and my parents, they also survived by the help of the Muhammadan. One of their friend, he said, you shouldn't, there's something gonna happen tonight. You should just go take your family and just go just like you're going for a shopping. Don't take anything. Just you think you are gonna go shopping around two hours after there's a train gonna go. Everything's still calm, it was not bad. You should take a train and just go. My father listened to him and they took the train and believe me, they left. And he, the idea was after a few days you can come back. 
So they didn't suffer at all in that way. The crossbow was a border on the other side. But somehow, me got to have this experience. Worry about my sister. But I tell you, when I saw my parents and my mother, and I wish the picture, if the, the picture is a picture of a million dollars. I forgot the whole world. There's any misery or anything. I gave, I put, hold my, held my sister's hand, gave to my mom. I said, I'm done with the responsibility. <laughs> I don't want, I, please don't ever leave me anywhere else. So for me, it was over. But that time, I feel like it. Oh, my parent felt I didn't care. The only sad part was that my grandmother, I was very fond of her. She, she passed away. And I didn't say goodbye to her. So that was, I can say in short, things what happened, you know. I didn't care, we don't have a house. We don't have anything, but I thought I got my parents, I got my sister, brother, which is, to me, more than anything. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Uh, do you have a message you'd like to share? Yes, I have a message for that. That's, I'm going to want him because everybody want to make simple. The thing is, the... At the time when I growing up, I learned a lot of things. I, I admire my father's, how he managed. He was a self-made man. He didn't have, he, he actually he was, he made it big, his business and everything. But when he realized in this world, nothing is more important than education. If you are educated, you never leave anywhere. No partition can take you. You have all this with you. And he did his best. We, our education would have gone. He made us to go to school. And then, not only I, I got the degree in teaching, and I taught the history to my student. And I learned more about that partition. At that time, people didn't understand what freedom is. They hated the idea. They said, we are very happy under British rule. Why we needed freedom? We don't have a home. We don't have a friendship. We don't have anything. They didn't have the value of the freedom because they didn't have the education. I learned in life, you should be educated. And then it gives you the idea the freedom doesn't come cheap. The freedom is such a precious thing, you have to sacrifice. And when that problems happen, you don't lose your courage. Stay strong and make sure that your children keep their education. Then they learn how precious the freedom is. No, India is doing good. I know so many people lost their life. We lost, people lost their lands. But these things are, you can make it. But freedom is priceless. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, our next partition witness is um, Dr. Prem Bajaj. Um, Dr. Bajaj, could you tell us um, a little bit about your favorite memories from your childhood? In 1947, a few days before the partition, I came from Karachi. This was my third visit to Karachi. People do not believe that I know Urdu and not Hindi at all. Urdu was the state language. I did my high school from Punjab Institute Lahore, which is now in Pakistan. 
in India, there's a custom, at least there was a custom, after the exam, there was two, three months of gap before you know whether you pass or fail. I used those two months to, to go to Karachi. My brother was posted there. I went in 1945, 46, and 47, two months each. I had just come back from Karachi sometime around 1st of August, and with a lot of excitement to know that India is going to be independent. I was in the state of Punjab, which was 60, 40, or 45, 55 borderline. Punjab and Bengal, these were the two states where the Hindus and the Muslims, they were evenly split, or almost evenly split. I did not know, neither my family, anybody did not know whether when the partition announced will be in Pakistan or India. People were excited about the independence, but did not know whether they will become part of Pakistan or India. I did not know much. We used to shout in clubs, in the bath, those kind of things, movement for independence. And this much I can say about the memories as a child, more later as the question asks. Yeah. Um, can you tell us your journey during partition or what you saw in 1947? In terms of actual seeing the partition, I was only 14 years old and we were lucky enough that the town of Rosebrook came to India. We did not have to suffer. My father, at one time in the Indian Railways, he had later on joined the Indian Army. The administration, the government thought that he had exposure to railways and also to the army. He put it in charge of one of the trains. He would commute the trains back and forth with one of the, the railway guards. He brought stories and told stories that were unbelievable. As is expected, most of most people they dwell on stories that are horrible and they were all true. But not many people have the courage to tell that they were good people too. As my wife commented, but for a Muslim gentleman, her family would not have been here and she would not be here either. That's not the only case. Just after partition, in this village about 10 miles from from the border, some Muslim dacoits, they looted the village and kidnapped a girl to, to a town, Kasul, in Pakistan. After a few days, one day she came outside the house. Another, another Muslim from the same village had gone to Pakistan from India. He said, my daughter, Veda, how are you here? What brought you here? She quickly said, Father, I did not come here. I have been kidnapped. The man had the guts to speak up. He said, from this moment onwards, you are going to stay in our house till you are gone back to India. He took the risk of his life. Muslims could have killed him. But by that time, things had come. He did not get killed at all. He was able to send the girl back to India. Not only this, in one of the books I read, an army company in Pakistan, it was Hindu company, they were destined to go to India. And their commander was Muslim. He said, a soldier without a rifle is not a soldier. Since this company is, a, is part of the army, give them their rifles, they'll go back along with their rifles and ammunition. As luck would have it, along the way, this company, they had problems, but for the rifles, they would have lost their lives. There have been many, many cases, but all those cases have been such where people took the risk of their life. You cannot face the mob. If you know, if I'm a Hindu, if I defend a Muslim, the mob is going to kill not only me and my father, everybody else. 
is a big risk. Not only this, at this moment we talk about so many refugees from Syria, countries, which country picks up so many in USA, there's a question whether to let the people come or not. So many refugees came from India to Pakistan and corresponding number went to Pakistan. In India, refugees, they settled themselves, they had the courage to find their own way. I do not, have not seen any news item where Indian government or the people ask help from any country at all. Refugees did all on their own till they were set. is a big plus for them. In the mob mentality, people go by what people see. There's a gamble. If you face the mob, mob is going, going to kill you. But there have been a lot of good, good incidences that need to be focused most. It needs a lot of courage to speak up against the mob. And I would suggest to give some, some more publicity to events that were good, positive, but we look afterwards. People lived before partition, people lived after partition. At WSU, so many Muslim students I had in my classes, they made A's and B's, some of them, they did masters and all those things. I have now had any distinction between Hindus and Muslims. A Muslim or Hindu, I think, religion is its own personal view. You keep it within the house, do what you want. As long as it doesn't affect me, it's okay. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing your story. <laughs> do you happen to have a message you'd like to share? The message is simple. The independence is not so easy to get. In USA, the women had a difficult time getting the vote. Not only the women, the black, the black Americans. The vote was very difficult to get, and unluckily, USA is one of the, the least, least voting nations. Australia has a required voting. If, some, if you don't vote, they, find, they put your penalty for so much. Vote whatever you want. If you want to complain, speak up. It is commonly said the kids and the older people that are willing to speak. Kids know nothing, and older people have nothing to lose. And that's one reason they say kids and the older people that are able to, able to speak up. My suggestion, message would be, if you have complained, don't complain to your friend. Speak up to the nation. Write a letter to the, to the newspaper or wherever you want. Let the people know that you do not like it. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Bajaj. Thank you. So um, next we'll hear the story of Mrs. Zahida Lodi Khan. Um, as translated by her son, Meraz Khan, or grandson, sorry. Um, okay, so um, Mrs. Khan, can you tell us um, your favorite um, ways of having fun when you were growing up? So for the answer of this question, I might not be able to translate the exact words what she said, but I'll be able to tell you what she meant. Uh, she was born and raised in the city of Panipat, which is close to Delhi, and people who have read the history of India, they have uh, read about the famous Battle of Panipat. Uh, so they had their, prim, uh, their, their main house in Panipat, but they, you know, they had their business in Delhi, which is now the capital of India. Uh, so she remembers that she used to go to Delhi every year for the two months vacation, you know, which comes in the summer in the June, in June and July. So she used to go there, you know, and uh, she used to have fun. All she remembered and cared for is the dolls she had. She used to play with them. She used to have a swing, which she used to sit on, you know, and she used to play. Uh, uh, closer to partition, you know, th she was in Delhi from Panipat, you know, she had taken her just one suitcase, you know, like when you go for vacation, you just take a few clothes and then you just walk to 
a place where you want to. So they said, so they just went to Delhi and they were there and then the partition thing started and then they had to, you know, start moving from uh, India to Pakistan. Um, thank you for sharing. Um, can you tell us about your journey from Paniput to Karachi in 1947? So where we left before, that they were in Delhi, she and her mother were in Delhi and then, you know, the partition thing started off and then people had to move from India to Pakistan and then from Pakistan to India. So they were not able to go back to Panipat to get their stuff from because everything was in Panipat. The house, the things in the house, their clothes and everything. So they weren't, they weren't, they weren't able to go back to Panipat, but her father, you know, my great grandfather, he had the chance to go back to Panipat and get all the other people who were our family members, you know, who were in Panipat. So they were, you know, so he brought them back to Delhi where everyone assembled. Uh, one of our, my maternal grandfather, who was his cousin, who was her cousin, uh, he was in the army, so he helped them come over from Panipat to Delhi, where they all were assembled. She also remembers the story in Delhi, you know, when, when these riots started and close to 14th August, you know, before 14th August, uh, she wasn't allowed to go on the roof of the house because, you know, there was fighting going around all, on all the sides of the house. There were bombs, like the small bombs, they were trying to kill each other. And so she remembers that when she, she was obviously bored at home, like kids, you know, they, they like to play outside, they like to go outside the house, but she wasn't able to do so. So she just sneaked up to the roof and she just stood up there and tried to look what was going around. So someone who was down there, you know, they fired a bullet towards her but it just went past her ear. It did not touch her face, it did not kill her. So she says that it was because of God that it did not hit her and she's today alive. She's alive today, otherwise, you know, you, would, you wouldn't know what, what could happen to you. Uh, coming from uh, Delhi to Karachi, obviously, you know, you wouldn't find a passenger plane at that time. So the only thing that was available was just tickets for a cargo plane which was a luxury at that time because as we just saw in a few pictures that people had to go through trains and you know, they were killing people in trains going from Pakistan to India and India to Pakistan. Both ways, you know, people were dying. So she, she and all her family members, they all got into a cargo plane and flew from Delhi to Karachi. And, but her father did not go because he wanted to, you know, get all the things he could from Delhi to Karachi because they wanted to go there and live a better life, probably not a better life, but something decent. She also remembers stories of my grandfather who was also her cousin and you know, they later got married. So my grandfather, he used to study in a, in a college in Delhi. So he used to, when he was, before coming to Karachi, you know, he had given his exams. So in the school, people just came in and they just killed everyone they could see. And very few people survived that, and one of one of those were my was my grandfather. You know, he he had hid behind a tree or somewhere, and he wasn't you know he wasn't killed, so he was able to escape that scene. But he still remembered all those things. And when he came to Pakistan, he wasn't feeling well. He had typhoid, and then obviously you know when you remember b those bad things, you can't sleep at night and all those problems. So uh, they all moved to Karachi, and then in Karachi. Uh, obviously they had left everything back in their cities in India. So in Karachi, you know, they could have just taken over any houses, any anything they wanted to, like what had happened in Panipat where her house was, and you know, people had looted in, they had taken all the stuff they could, they had broken all the stuff they could. But when they came to Karachi, they didn't do that. They first lived in a quarter, quarter is a small house, you know, it's like, where all the poor people live, and then they can just get a room. It's like a studio apartment. So there was one person who was living there, so they went there and lived there. But later onwards, when her father came from Delhi to Karachi, he had bought uh, some money. So they had bought a house for 60,000 rupees at that time, which is equal to $600 if you convert the rate at this time. But at that time, that was a huge deal. You know, you could buy a mansion for that money. So. There was this Hindu guy who, whom, from whom they had bought this house, and 
they did not, you know, just take over the house, but they paid him money, and then they lived here. And that Hindu person and his family, they also lived in that house for, for the time being, you know, because if they had traveled to India, they probably, you know, something could have happened. So they stayed there until, you know, things just calmed down and things were better. So after everything was done, they had just moved, he had just moved, you know, uh, back to India and then they lived in Karachi and they've lived there for the most part of their life until, until moving here. Thank you, sorry for, for you, sorry if it was long. No worries. Um, thank you both for sharing. Um, I wanted to ask if you happen to have a message that you'd like to share with us. So she says that the, the main asset a person has is love. And love between two people, between communities, between religions, between everyone. Uh, she remembers that, you know, they had everything back in India and they used to meet people, you know, who were of different religions and everything was going fine. You know, they used to meet each other, but apparently at one day when this partition thing started, they just, you know, drifted away and people started to fight and they started to, you know, uh, dislike each other, which was not the case before this 1947 thing. So all she wants is that we all should live peacefully and not, you know, try to kill each other or, you know, do bad, not uh, in a, per you can all, you can consider, consider that in a personal capacity or even, you know, a, a globally, and you can think of it as, you know, love has no boundaries as we, as we all know. So just spread love and not hatred. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, before we go to Q&A, I just wanted to share quickly um, that there's a common thread in these stories um, of people coming together and people remaining friends even during that time. Um, usually when we hear about partition, we hear about the violence, and partition certainly was a very violent event, um, but we tend to overlook um, the compassion, the instances of coming together. And so I think that sharing these stories is really important in that way. It can reveal stories we otherwise wouldn't hear. Thank you. Sure. Does does anyone have any questions? Um, I was curious if if any of the panel or any of any of you all have are familiar with the film by Amar Kanwar, A Season Outside, mm -hmm. and particularly how I mean it, it seems incredibly resonant to the, all this. And I'm just wondering if so, uh, if you've seen it, if any of you have seen it, how how it how you feel about it in regards to this show and this conversation. Has anyone else seen it? I've seen it, but I don't know it very well. But I am a big, I, I love his work, love and respect his work. Um, in fact, he was, he was closely um, in the running for this exhibition. So it's really great that you brought him up. Yeah. What is it, Randy? A Season Outside. No, and, and I should mention too that there's a there's a great exhibition of contemporary art that was done just on partition called it's either zones of control or lines of control. Um, it was done in Chicago, I think, right? I really recommend if you're interested in learning more about contemporary art around this issue, it's a good it's a good resource. And that video is in that show. From both sides of the border, so um, if you are interested in the subject, it's a really great way to explore those things. I, I actually remember that film now that you sort of re-described it for me. 
Yeah, it takes place on the Waga border. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it, I would encourage you to look for fiction and nonfiction and films about partition because they really give a good sense of sort of the, the affective dynamics of the conflict. Hi, Ooh, thank you so much. And um, uh, my question has uh, concerns with the government's decision to go towards partition. And I, and I know our honored guests were young when this happened, but uh, my question is how did the government present this solution to its citizens? And, um, and then how does that compare with the reality that happened? I think uh, <clears throat> it's, it's a complicated question, I think. First of all, I want to acknowledge that. But uh, I think uh, it's difficult to answer this question, uh, but I'll make an attempt to do that. I think the, there are a lot of things that were going on at the time. I think uh, it was not even clear what people wanted. Uh, and, uh, you know, there were even Muslims also. It was not clear that... Uh, every Muslim wanted a different nation. Because if you remember the maps, uh, how Muslims are, uh, you know, Hindus and Muslims were not, you know, there were different areas where they were concentrated, but even in this main body of India, the, the modern India that it, it is right now, there are Muslims who are living next to each other. Uh, I mean, there is still, you know, there are, uh, India has the second largest Muslim population. The modern India has the second largest Muslim population. Uh, so where are they now? I mean, so how, so how did that happen? And why did they not leave India and go to Pakistan? Uh, and I think so, so uh, uh, the presentation was, Crips plan was the one that was presented initially and then it evolved. It continued to evolve from 1937 until the very last day. And I think it was only in March 47, I think if that is uh, basically then it started to take firm shape. Um, Mountbatten was an admiral in the, arm, in the in Navy. I mean, he was uh, basically, the, the, if you look at the history and the war, the Second World War, is also quite uh, relevant for partition. Um, um, British forces, uh, you know, it was very clear at the end that uh, British were not interested in continuing to rule India after the war was over. It was very clear. In fact, uh, uh, you know, uh, Winston Churchill actually had lost election in 1945, if you remember that. I mean, you know, Labour government came to power in 1945. And the first thing that they did was that we are not going to rule colonies because Britain had no resources to continue to rule. And, and when they started to make the plans for leaving the colonies, India was the biggest colony that they had. Uh, it was... The division was, I think, as, as we as, as this came out during the discussion, uh, the biggest problem was for Punjab and Bengal, because that's where, as Dr. Bajaj mentioned, and uh, that that's where the the population was evenly divided, more or less. So how do you divide a state like that, a province like that? Uh, the, pro the, the areas which were clearly predominantly Muslims. You could either have self-determination, which was basically they, they become self-governing state, autonomous, or they join Pakistan. Those were the three options that were given to everybody. You know, join India, join Pakistan, or stay independent. Just imagine how confusing that was. If you look at the map, if you recall the map, if everybody wanted to do that, fortunately, that what happened was that they either joined Pakistan or either joined India. And uh, with the exception of Kashmir, which ultimately made the decision at the very last minute to join India, um, uh, all the princely states decided to join one or the other. And I think that's how it happened. So I think to, to sum up your question, and I, I don't think I have answered your question very well, the thing was that there was no really, really no plan. And I think that's actually what is the contribution to the, the con contributed the confusion amongst the population and led to the anxiety and led to the violence, I think. Uh, I guess your question was that well, how they communicated to the people that partition was taking place, right? Uh, 
وہاں پہ اور پھر قتل عام شروع ہو گیا تھا قتل عام بہت زیادہ ہو گیا تھا اس قدر کہ وہ ہر ایک جگہ باہر نکلنے کے کوئی چانس نہیں تھا کچھ نہیں تھا اس میں اور نعرے لگتے تھے تقاریر ہوتی تھیں اور اس میں ریڈیو پہ بھی ہوتا تھا اعلان کہ بھائی پاکستان بن گیا ہمیں تو یہی تھا کہ بھائی پاکستان پتہ نہیں کیسا ہوگا پاکستان جائیں گے تو بہت خوش تھے ہم لوگ کہ پاکستان پہنچیں گے راستے کی تھکن وہ سب ہو جائے گی اور پھر یہ ہے کہ وہ وہاں سے بس یہ پتہ لگا جس طرح اسی طرح پتہ لگا ریڈیو چاہے ہوتے تھے اس زمانے میں ریڈیو سے پتہ لگ گیا تقاریر ہوئیں ان سے پتہ لگ گیا لیکن ہنگامے جو ہوئے نا اس سے زیادہ وہ ہوا پھر سو دا مین یو نو ایٹ دیٹ ٹائم ٹی وی واز ناٹ دیٹ پاپولر سو دا مین وے ٹو کمیونیکیٹ ٹو پیپل واز تھرو ریڈیو یو نو یو کین دے یوز ٹو ہیو اسپیچز آل اوور دا کنٹری اینڈ پیپل آل دا بگ لیڈرس دے یوز ٹو ہیو اسپیچز اینڈ ایون دا لوکل لیڈرس یو نو بی بی ایف دی ڈزنٹ میٹر وچ کنٹری دے ور گوئنگ ٹو اور واٹ کنٹری دے ور سپورٹنگ بٹ دے یوز ٹو ہیو اسپیچز یو نو سو دوز ور دا ویز دے کمیونیکیٹڈ ٹو دا پیپل یو نو ہاؤ دیٹ پاکستان واز گوئنگ ٹو بی میڈ اینڈ دین وٹ دا برٹش ول یو نو گو بیک ٹو ویئر دے کیم فرام اینڈ دین سیکنڈلی واٹ what you know exactly told people that something was happening is that riots started you know people used to kill each other and then you know they used to have rallies you know rallies like a bunch of people you know a group of people they get together and then they shout what they want to tell the world so they used to say pakistan zindabad and even if you you know watch movies nowadays you know you can see how those things work so basically you know radio and then what happened around was the way you got to know that pakistan was being built and the British were going back. Thank you. Yes. Um, I would like to uh, add to, I would like to appraise what Mr. Pajaj, Ms. Pajaj said earlier, that education is really important and it is through education that you come to know the real meaning of freedom. And I would like to relate this to the presentation which was shown Uh, maybe it was the lack of education that uh, Muslims were unaware that they wanted a separate nation. And as education grew more uh, common within the Muslims, they started to demand for a separate uh, homeland for themselves. Uh, I, I just wanted to go at the opinion of the panelists regarding this. The, the reason I said education is important, first thing, you know, I cannot, because I was so, at, at that time I didn't know, but as I, I saw, the, there are two reasons. First thing, people didn't, people didn't understand what freedom is. Because when you are losing, just like you say, you have your house and everything, you lose everything. You, Here you have a big house, you have a big prop business, and you lose everything. But if you have education, you don't lose it. That was the message I got from, actually from my father. He was not a educated, really bad person, but he heard the importance of education. That was one point. The second thing I feel, the, uh, when you have a problem, you know, people get killed, your family is not safe, and you always feel like there's no freedom to get out of the house, which I didn't suffer that part, because remember I told you, I got on the train and got the part which was no killing. But if you are still living there, and you still think that you're gonna get killed, you can go out, that was the point. The only thing I thought, if people, they really didn't think the importance of freedom that time. They're, they're thinking, they're leaving the house, leaving the things are important. But if the, in the long run, if you are educated, if you know how much freedom is important, So 
or if they are educated, maybe we didn't have that much killing. Uh, just like uh, she told you, because I personally, even as a little girl, we have a very good friendship with the Mohammedans. Because there was, a, we were, they had, they, they respect their religion, Hindu re respect their religion. There was no, they have a Eid celebration. These people, Hindu has a Diwali has celebration. And they exchange gift in that way. But all of this is the education was the problem that they got so much right. That's my thing. That one way, the other one was, I feel like if they are, people are educated, people understand what education is, but then will understand what freedom is. Even for the Hindu and Muslims, uh, the freedom make, if they, this is a big sad part is, India got freedom without a drop of bloodshed, which is unusual through any history. You can see any, but after getting a freedom, there was so much killing, which you, is unbelievable. They go in the train, if a Hindu train's coming, Muslims slept down. They didn't think it's a baby or mother or anyone. If Mohammedans train coming, the Hindu did the same thing, and Hindu, the vice versa. It was so bad, people got wild. And that's why Mahatma Gandhi did the fast, and the fast, he said, I'm going to have this fast, and the freedom, this chaos stopped. That was my point. Uh, due to time constraints, I'll just answer directly because she just told me what she wanted to say. Uh, yes, definitely their education has an impact on people. You know, at that time, close to 1947, all the leaders who were on top were educated. They had good education and you know, that is why they were asking for freedom. And if you, can, if you look at Mahatma Gandhi, you know, he, he had studied law and then he had practiced in South Africa and then he had come back. Similarly for Muhammad Ali Jinnah, you know, who was one of the main people who were, who, because of whom, you know, Pakistan is a separate country today. So he was a lawyer from England and then he had studied in Lincoln's Inn, which is one of the most prestigious places, you know, you could go for law. So education did impact freedom, you know, everyone who wanted freedom, if they have good, if they had good, they had good education, and that is the reason, you know, they were enlightened that, you know, living under British rule was not the easiest way or the best way. Thank you. Uh, and I would like to add a few more points to the uh, history. The inception of Pakistan basically started in 1930 uh, when the national poet of Pakistan, uh, Muhammad Dr. Iqbal, uh, addressed the nation in Allahabad in his famous address in, even, in which he mentioned that the western provinces of the Indian subcontinent should join together for a separate nation. And then in 1940, a resolution was passed uh, by the All India Muslim League demanding for a separate homeland. And then gradually, after the World War II, since the British Empire got weakened in the subcontinent, efforts were directly made for the separate uh, homeland for the Muslims. Uh, thank you. Could the panel tie in Kashmir into this a little bit? Is that say, possible? Wanna... Yeah, um, so Kashmir, as, uh, as Dr. Rai pointed out, was a princely state um, in 1947. It was ruled, <coughs> pardon me, sorry. It was ruled by a Hindu ruler. It had a majority Muslim population. Um, and when they, when the partition happened, there was a question about whether partition, uh, whether Kashmir would decide to join with India or Pakistan. Um, and it ultimately began 
a standstill agreement with Pakistan. That means that it had intentions to join Pakistan, but there was a whole series of conflicts around the border, um, partially because the rulers of the Hindu state of, of Kashmir were relatively autocratic, and partially because there was a whole series of, of Muslim raiders who were coming in from the Pakistan side. So this is around, sort of, right around partition. Um, and what ends up happening, more or less, and of course, there's a lot more, right? This is also a 60-minute talk. Um, what ends up happening is uh, the, the um, raiders were coming through and the Hindu ruler of Kashmir said to India, could you please come and help? And India said, why sure, we could come and help if you decide to accede to India. And he said, awesome, let's do that. And so we ended up, you ended up in a situation where, you know, colloquially, he said, awesome, let's do that. He didn't really say that. Um, I'm not quoting. Um, so we had this situation where you had um, essentially the first war, the first Indo-Pak war in 1947 and 48, along those the lines of where the, the Pakistan army came to and where the Indian army came to. And it was a complicated war, at least in part because the armies that were fighting each other were, up until months ago, the same army, the same battle members. The people knew each other well. They could, there, there are stories, both fiction and nonfiction, of, of battalions sort of shouting across at each other, hey, is that you? Hey, it's you. How did, I didn't know you lived through the world, first, second world war. Congratulations, like, how's your sister? She's great. So there's this very complicated relationship that happens in Kashmir right around that time. There's a stalemate that happens at the at the point of the stalemate. That's where you end up with the line of control ultimately. I think uh, what Emily said is, uh, is is true, and I think there was actually a third option that was given to all princely states, which was to stay to, uh, autonomous. And I think it goes back to what was offered in 1939, when the when British when when British actually vo volunteered all the whole India India to to the world war, to the war effort of British, uh, uh, to Britain, they offered to all prince, uh, princely states that you, uh, when India becomes independent, you will have the option of staying free or autonomous. You don't have to join India or Pakistan. Whatever the outcome is, you will stay autonomous. So Maharaja Hari Singh, who was a Hindu ruler of Kashmir, decided at the time of independence in 1947, he chose the third option to stay free. And of course, that, that was maybe, that was just basically a temporary option. And uh, that actually is, uh, and, and he said that uh, then when, when the attackers came in at that time, the fact is, the fact is that basically that ultimately he joined India. Okay, so ultimately, as per the plan, he joined India. Whether, whatever his initial intention was, he did join India. That is the official thing. But by the time the battle lines had been drawn, so when you see the map of Kashmir, <clears throat> About one third of Kashmir is, by the time when he said, I'm joining India, Pakistani army forces had occupied one third of, that is where the actual line of control is drawn, LOC line of control that is called. Uh, Pakistani army had taken that part of Kashmir. Indian army had taken the rest of the control. And that's where basically, the act, that, that, that's where the stalemate is right now. That is where, so when you look at, the map drawn by Indian, by India, you see the whole Kashmir. A and when you look at the maps drawn by Google, it shows the part of Kashmir that is drawn along line of control, LOC. And when you draw it, by, uh, you know, map drawn by Pakistan, it shows the whole Kashmir as part of uh, part of uh, Pakistan. None of that. The actual reality is that. Part of Kashmir is controlled by Pakistan, part of Kashmir is controlled by India, and actual line of control, LOC, is the basically where the st stalemate has happened. And what Emily said in 1947, it, the, the, the national institutions, the railways, the army, they basically they were integrated. They were basically Hindus and Muslims who, were, who lived together, fought together as a part of the British army. And now suddenly, because of this partition, they were in opposite sides fighting with each other. So 1948 was, and I, th I think it continued till 1956, 65 war, second war, uh, 71 war, which created Bangladesh, uh, was, was different matter. But I think, you know, 
Another thing I would like to add is that, you know, as the partition grows distant, distant in memory, the new generation of uh, people are, are, you know, for them, it, it is a second-hand experience. Uh, it's, a, it's an experience that they hear from their parents and grandparents. And I think so with this particular project is very, very important because the oral history should be recorded for, for, rest, for, 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 for people in future. I will, I will tell you my personal experience. I'm a post-partition person. I was born after, much after partition. I grew up in part of, you know, if you remember, it was part of India that was controlled, actually ruled by princely states. It was one of the princely states where I grew up in part of Rajasthan, which borders Pakistan. We had a lot of displaced people who came and settled in India in that part. I grew up with people, my friends were Muslims, we had family friends who were Muslims. We had household health who were Hindus and Muslims. We had friends who were Mus Hindus and Muslims. Uh, and for me, religion was not the dividing factor. It was economic, you know, socioeconomic uh, you know, status that was a dividing factor perhaps. But, and you know, I, I don't say that with, with pride or anything, but, but that is how things were. It was not religion. It was education and maybe the social economic factor. Uh, and that's how things were. I didn't control it. I didn't control it, but that's what my world was. And I remember going to my Muslim friends for their festivals and Muslim friends coming to my home for, for festivals. And as uh, Mrs. Bajaj mentioned, we celebrated each other's festivals. And for that was fun. I mean, you know, in India, we have so many festivals and so many religions. So it, it, for a child, it is just, you know, like the, the whole year is full of candies and, you know, the equivalent of candies because you have Diwali festival and you have Eid festival. And you have, you get uh, Sivais for, for, for Eid and you get, uh, you know, the Diwali sweets. So for a child, it is just, you know, just uh, life is full of, uh, at least for me, it was just like that. And it, it is still is, uh, you know, uh, and maybe, you know, uh, that, that is what my word view was uh, for that. I still heard the stories. Uh, my grandfather was a police officer and the equivalent of uh, um, a public prosecutor. Uh, and, and he mentioned the trains and the things that he saw. So for me, I, as a child, I heard the stories from him about what the horrors of, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of the violence of partition. But I, I think what we hear, and I think you know, what we hear are the basically the, the violence, but we don't hear the good stories that Mrs. Bajaj mentioned that there was a Muslim family that saved his life. There were Hindu families that saved him, the lives of Muslims. And we don't hear more about those because they, though, that, those things also happen. And I think, I think it's, uh, you know, hopefully through oral history, we will get to yeah. know the more of those stories. That's, that's a Just great one thing, just on Kashmir. Just to answer your question, uh, the stance of Pakistan and Kashmir was, you see, the army was divided and, you know, the top most, uh, the army personnel were British. So Muhammad Ali Jinnah, who was the Governor General of Pakistan, sent General Gracie, who was, you know, the Commander in Chief of the Pakistan Army to Kashmir when, you know, all the troops had moved in and, you know, definitely the people of Kashmir also wanted help from Pakistan side, all the ones who wanted to come to Pakistan. So General Gracie, he went there and he refused to fight against the Indian Army because, because he said that, I also report to the Queen, all the people on the other side also report to the Queen and Lord Bountbatten, who was the Governor General of India, is also a part of the kingdom. So I will not fight. So technically, you know, the people, the army given to Pakistan was incapable of, you know, handling the situation. And, you know, you can say whatever you want to about what people did to each other. That's a different story. But, you know, from Pakistan's side, there was retaliation. They, were, they tried to stop the inflow of the army into Kashmir. But they were not, you know, able to do so yeah. because General Gracie, he did not uh, agree to that. And uh, that's, that's it. Thank you. Thank you. As you can tell, there's a lot of um, different opinions on the subject. But thank you all for joining us this evening. And I really want to thank our panelists for being here. And especially um, you all for sharing your stories with us so openly. Thank you so much. And, and please do, if you're interested in, 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 can, in helping to record these stories, please do join us tomorrow night at 6 o'clock at the Ulrich. Thank you. <laughs>